What? Cut! No, 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 man! You're making me fall asleep! To death, bro! Okay, the line is... Say what? Hey, everybody, so, uh... Here's a few, uh... A few more corrupt cops for you guys. And, uh... At the end, it's gonna be a little special video that I'm gonna put in there. And the v end video is one of the reasons why I do what I do. And you guys will understand once you see it. He pulls me over to the side of the driveway. He then states he wanted to tase me if he had a taser and would have shot and killed me if he had drawn his weapon and he would have been fully justified in killing me. Ever since I was a, a little child, my parents have instilled in me a love for the values that the United States holds dear. My parents came to the United States from a brutal military dictatorship and they chose the United States because of our constitution. Nicholas Aquino was born and raised in the United States after his family fled Paraguay. He says his understanding of his family's difficult past made him want to give back for the freedoms the U.S. provided. That is one of many factors in, in terms of why I wanted to serve this country was so that I could uphold those ideals, that I could fight, that I could give back to the community and make sure that they keep those freedoms. When I was really little, probably about three, I went to my first air show. I always loved the Air Force. I remember just wanting to be a part of this country and serving it. Aquino attends the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and in many ways has become quite the poster child for the military. So when he found out there was a warrant out for his arrest, he was shocked. I never was arrested, charged, cited, booked, nothing. I've never even had a, had a ticket. He found out he was being charged with resisting arrest during an incident that happened in December of 2013, an incident in which he believes he was the victim. One of Aquino's neighbors had reported seeing a suspicious person at Aquino's address. Aquino had been living there for a few months, but the neighbor was rarely around and didn't recognize him. Sheriff's Deputy Ivan Rodriguez followed up on the call and checked out the residence, but Aquino said the officer didn't provide any identification when he went out to greet him. There are plenty of police impersonators out there. A badge online costs 60 bucks to get. So my question to him was, excuse, uh, excuse me, who are you and uh, why are you here? He said he was investigating suspicious activity in the area. I asked him, am I being detained? He said, yes. So I was like, okay, my name is Nicholas Aquino. I live right here. How long am I being detained for? What are the charges? And do you have a warrant? Everything that Nicholas was doing to me is sort of like textbook, like, okay, I'm gonna be respectful. I'm gonna answer questions, but I'm also gonna insist that you answer questions for me because I am within my rights on my property to ask these questions. Aquino's lawyer, Stephen Liner, says that nothing Nicholas did suggested aggression, and the arrest report agrees. The officer, though he couldn't be reached for comment, wrote in the report that the male looked to have a normal to slightly nervous demeanor, but did not immediately seem confrontational or aggressive, but that he later asked in a confrontational tone if he was being detained. The officer, appear, he appears to have been offended at the idea that a citizen would question his authority. At the officer's request, Aquino showed his military ID and other forms of identification, but the officer was still unconvinced and moved to physically detain him. He just grabbed my wrist without any warning, without provocation, uh, put me in a front headlock choke. The technical term is a front guillotine, slammed my head into the ground. So currently, I still have uh, fluid buildup in, in the back of uh, my right ear. Right head contusion, both arms, abrasions and contusions on uh, the elbows, knees, hip, right hip. Using force should have been the last resort unless there was some reason to believe that um, Nicholas was doing something that was um, going to you know, harm him at that moment. And there was nothing that he was doing that would cause that. Eventually, Aquino was able to convince the officer that he did in fact live there. The officer did not apologize. He pulls me over to the side of the driveway and he does basic victim, uh, victim blaming. So he says, 
It was my fault for not knowing my neighbors. He then states he wanted to tase me if he had a taser and would have shot and killed me if he had drawn his weapon and he would have been fully justified in killing me. I think that sometimes police officers are so used to being in control of every situation that just any small amount of perceived resistance from a citizen causes them to treat them like they are, you know, um, a criminal. There was no reason to physically detain me or arrest me. Um, as far as putting me in a chokehold, um, even if my muscles tensed, um, the automatic reaction to being choked is to tense up, reach for the neck. Yet the DA used this perceived tension as a springboard for the charges against Aquino, resisting arrest and obstructing a peace officer. Are we supposed to just bend over and excuse my French, just take it? Just because a person is on a power trip and feels that he can bully you into, into submission? Prescription drug abuse has become an epidemic in America. Few places have been hit harder than Kentucky, a state that's also been ravaged by addiction to crystal meth. In Whitley County, Kentucky, in the heart of Appalachia, matters were made worse when the man suspected of being at the center of the drug trade was the county's top law enforcement officer, Sheriff Lawrence Hodge. There had long been suspicions that Sheriff Hodge was dirty, but nobody, not even federal agents, could prove it. That's when two local journalists, both in their 20s, launched their own investigation, and they soon discovered poking into the affairs of a powerful county sheriff can be risky business. The story will continue in a moment. You know, you're, you're 20 years old, you're taking a shower one day and getting ready for class and you get a call from a federal agent because there's a credible threat against your life. Everything about it's just so surreal, you know, you don't, you don't think a whole lot about it. Then later that night, you know, you start thinking, you're like, geez, somebody wants to kill me. That's a little odd. Um, and, and, and it's the sheriff. The sheriff wants to kill you. This wasn't exactly how Adam Salfridge had pictured a career in journalism. Adam was born and raised in Whitley County. In 2009, he was a sophomore at the local college, needed a job. The county's daily newspaper, the Times Tribune, had an opening, and soon Adam had his first assignment and dangerous enemies. Why did you feel compelled to buy a gun? You do have a credible threat against your life, and it seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Samantha also purchased a gun at the same time. Samantha Swindler, then 27, was managing editor of the Times Tribune and Adam's boss. We were reporting on people involved in the drug trade and people who are all hopped up on oxys, I don't know what they're gonna do. I thought if something happened, I'd go down with a fight. Samantha was exotic by Whitley County standards, born in New Orleans, educated in Boston. She tangled with public officials as editor of a small newspaper in East Texas. She saw familiar signs in Whitley County. There are problems in this community with the good old boy system, corrupt politics, that kind of thing. It seems to me in many ways that this community's strength was also its weakness in some ways. This is a nice, polite place where people have polite conversation. People it, are very proud here, and it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing in the way that it doesn't allow you to see the things that need change. Whitley County, Kentucky, population 35,000, is tucked in the state's southeast corner on the border with Tennessee. People here take pride in the natural beauty of Cumberland Falls and in historic Sanders Cafe, birthplace of Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is also poverty. The median income is $26,000. Drug addiction is rampant. Throughout the region, red signs identify homes once used as meth labs. And then there is prescription drug abuse. Oxycodone flows in so freely they call this stretch of I-75 the pill pipeline. In 2002, Lawrence Hodge was elected sheriff of Whitley County on the promise he'd clean it up. The sheriff's raid on one meth lab was covered by the local CBS affiliate. When I knocked on the door, the smell was already knocking me down. We're glad to shut it down and put a dent in our drug problem here. But early in his tenure, there were rumors. Talk around the county, the sheriff had gone bad. From about 2004, he just went downhill and was corrupt 
involved with drug dealers, uh, taking payoffs, extorting money from defendants. Todd Tremaine, a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, says the FBI and state police tried building a case against Sheriff Hodge, but couldn't penetrate his inner circle of drug dealers, crooked politicians and police officers. He was very insulated. What do you mean insulated? There was a lot of fear uh, of what Lawrence might do if they cooperated with the feder federal agents or the state police. He was untouchable. Yes. Editor Samantha Swindler had heard similar stories and suspected Sheriff Hodge might have a weakness, a paper trail. So she checked the department's evidence law. There were months where nothing was checked in. I knew that this wasn't right because we had arrest every day in this area, particularly related to drugs. And when it was related to drugs, you know there's probably a gun and it wasn't there. But to mount a serious investigation of the sheriff, Samantha needed help. Why would you hire a 20-year-old, his only journalism experience was working on his high school newspaper? Well, when you say it like that. Oh, it's true. <laughs> well, he was smart, and he knew about the community, and he cared about um, local government. My aunt overdosed, and the first question I had was, I wonder if she got her drugs from somebody that the sheriff was, you know, protecting. Adam went to work, combing through years of case files. He noted arrests where drugs and weapons were seized by the sheriff's department and should have been logged. It was tedious and time consuming. At that point, I was working up to like 70 hours a week. It was, it was insane and it wasn't healthy, but I was, you know, just driven. I, I, I knew I was onto something and I couldn't stop. What he was onto was a series of felony cases involving guns and drugs in which deals were cut and sentences mysteriously reduced. What's more, the defense attorney in each case was Sheriff Hodge's close friend, Ron Reynolds. One case involved this man, Rick Benson, a retired social worker. In May 2004, Sheriff Hodge and his men raided Benson's house. In addition to drugs, they found 17 guns. Benson had a previous felony conviction on drug and weapons charges, so was forbidden to own firearms. You knew that you'd go to prison? Probably for the rest of my life. Were you scared? Were you anxious? Oh, yeah, I was terrified. Because? My world was over. During the raid on the house, Sheriff Hodge found Benson's bank statement. There was $600,000 in his checking account alone. Despite appearances, this self-described meth abuser was a millionaire, heir to a publishing fortune. The night of his arrest, Benson says Sheriff Hodge offered him a deal. If he cooperated, the sheriff would see that Benson was represented by his old friend, attorney Ron Reynolds. I'd heard of Ron. And his reputation was? He could get things fixed. He said, I'll guarantee you misdemeanors, no jail time, but you're gonna have to move out of Kentucky. Did you think he was on the up and up? Well, no, if he was on the up and up, he wouldn't have been able to do that. How much was his fee? $150,000. $150,000 is a lot of money. The rest of your life in prison is a lot of time. Rick Benson says he was also forced to pay the sheriff $10,000 in cash and make a donation to the sheriff's department of $25,000. That's enough to make you say, okay, what's going on here? But then whenever you see the actual cashier's check in that file where he donated 25,000 to the sheriff's department as a condition of his plea agreement, that's just, I mean, that's crazy. With information on that case and others, Samantha and Adam pressed Sheriff Hodge for an interview. He reluctantly agreed. He was just all relaxed, leaned back in his chair, um, you know, being that good old boy. So the sheriff thought it was a field trip. Yeah, you know, you got this, this little out-of-towner girl and this 20-year-old college kid. We played along, we played nice for a very long time. Let him lie. In the course of that interview, legally recorded without Sheriff Hodge's knowledge, Adam asked him about the gun seized from Rick Benson, but the sheriff's answers didn't match the facts. He claimed the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, had them. I don't even know who Rick Benson is. He was a big case. Oh, that's ATF, yeah. How many guns was it? 17. Oh, Rick Benson? Yeah. They would have just said it. I tell you, you probably need to have an ATF agent here with me if you want to talk about that. So I need to ask them if they got those guns. Well, you just need to ask them about the whole case. So when the sheriff said he'd given guns to the ATF, you knew it was lying? They never took the guns. They never even opened a case in this uh, situation. And, and once we had that, I mean, he got a heck of a story. I was like, wow, I can't believe he just said that. He just kept lying, lying, lying. And I was, I was giddy. What do you make of that? The two 20-somethings right. with uh, pens and notebooks could do what seasoned law enforcement officers couldn't do. 
they weren't dangerous to them. I think Lawrence was thinking, hey kids, let me show you how the sheriff's department works. You know, here's, here's the jail and here's, here's Barney and you know, everybody from Mayberry, but they caught him off guard because they'd done their research. The reporters then filed what's called an open records request, requiring the sheriff to show where Benson's guns were stored. But six days later, Adam received a startling phone call. The sheriff's department's been bro broken into. And you know, that, that gets you out of bed real fast. That was my, we got you moment. I knew that he had staged it. I knew it. Sheriff Hodge claimed guns, drugs, and other evidence had been stolen. The office was trashed, but the door showed no sign of forced entry. It was just made to look like a burglary so they could explain for why the drugs and guns had been missing, and they'd been missing for several years. So what was Sheriff Hodge doing with these guns and drugs? Guns, gave them to political friends, sold them, trade them for uh, oxycodone. He became a drug addict. Yes, he was a very serious drug addict. He had a bad addiction with prescription pain pills. Adam and Samantha's interview with the sheriff and the phony burglary gave law enforcement the break they needed. The man who once thought himself untouchable was now feeling the heat. Days later, an undercover officer recorded Sheriff Hodge threatening to kill Adam. He said, I'm gonna effing kill him. And the, the informant's like, no, you're, you're just mad. And he goes, no, you don't understand. I'm gonna kill him. I've already been by his house. I know where he lives. Despite the threat, the Times Tribune continued to publish damaging allegations against the sheriff. And a state audit suggested he may have been stealing money from the department. He was just taking money and cashing it and during convenient times, like before a three-day weekend or right before his wife's birthday. By May 2010, the people of Whitley County had had enough. They voted Sheriff Hodge out of office. Six months later, he was indicted by a state grand jury. The most powerful lawman in Whitley County led away in handcuffs in his uniform. But Lawrence Hodge still had influence. Around the same time, two local thugs, friends of the sheriff, drove to Adam's house. The passenger in the vehicle gets out, approaches me without saying a word, puts his hand a little bit into his waistband, and I, I just quickly pulled my pistol. You had a pistol on you? At that point, I didn't go anywhere without being armed. He saw that it left the holster. I didn't point it at him or anything. And he explained that they were out looking for junk metal on my dead end street and that they would be going now. You pulled a <laughs> gun, were you prepared to use it? Well, you never pull a gun unless you're prepared to use it. Following that encounter, federal authorities compelled Adam to leave town under their protection. Already facing state charges, Lawrence Hodge was also being pursued by federal investigators. Central to their case was attorney Ron Reynolds, the sheriff's accomplice in the shakedown of Rick Benson. Reynolds turned on his old friend, implicating the sheriff in the extortion scheme. Lawrence Hodge had no choice but to cop a plea. Prosecutor told him, we can put you in prison for a very, very, very long time. Our case is solid. You will be convicted. You can see that uh, he was defeated. Last May, two years after Samantha and Adam launched their investigation, former Sheriff Lawrence Hodge pleaded guilty to extortion, distributing drugs, and money laundering. He was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. He declined our request for an interview. Now, that's mostly from the work that the two of you did, right? Yes. Samantha and Adams' reporting also led to the conviction of 15 of Lawrence Hodge's associates. Both journalists have since left the Times Tribune. Samantha lives in Oregon, where she's editor and publisher of a small weekly. Adam, just a year out of college and unemployed, remains in Whitley County. What went through your mind when you saw Sheriff Hodge in handcuffs in his uniform? You know, a lot of people thought that I would be jumping for joy and, you know, all elated there that the sheriff got arrested. And it's really not. It's terrible that this happened. I hate to see it for my community. Mm -hmm. I hate to see that plastered all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Whitley County, synonymous now with a corrupt sheriff. I don't like that. I think, uh, I think the real story should be that a bunch of people here came together and, you know, cleaned it up. These guys accused of being rogue cops were actually caught on tape during a drug raid. We've got the recording, and it's not flattering for one of the cops who's now facing criminal charges.
You're watching a performance by a rock band called One, Others Not Equal. But this story isn't about heavy metal. It's about allegations of heavy-handed and unprofessional police tactics. The lead singer, Rudy Simpson, says he was a victim of these tactics in a drug raid at his home. It all centers around this man, State Police Lieutenant Luke Davis, who's now facing corruption charges. In June of 2008, the Omni Drug Task Force, headed by Lieutenant Davis, executed a search warrant on Rudy Simpson's Monroe County home. They based the search on an anonymous tip and a marijuana stem they said they found in the garbage. When the cops came in, Rudy's band was practicing in this basement recording studio. What the police didn't know is that the microphones were hot and everything was being recorded. Take a listen. But they were mixing, and two cops take turns singing on the mic, not knowing the whole thing is being recorded. While those cops were in the basement, Rudy, his friend Jeremy, and members of the band were taken upstairs, where Lieutenant Davis and other task force members were searching the house. They were shocked by the behavior of the police. Very unprofessional. Um, almost thuggish. I felt violated and um, almost like if it was a game to them. Going into kitchen cabinets, eating cookies, and going in the refrigerator, eating stuff out of the refrigerator. It was very unprofessional. And it wasn't exactly a big drug haul for the cops either. Put on some the bag. They found a quarter ounce of marijuana, 12 small seedlings in a pot they claimed were marijuana, and a half a pain pill that Rudy later produced a prescription for. These guys say the police seemed more interested in Rudy's stuff than they were in the drugs they found. Basically what I heard them talking about was what equipment, what uh, materialistic stuff could they take out of my house. It seems like, yeah, that they were just trying to figure out what they could come out of here with. And now, hear it for yourself, caught on the band's equipment that the cops don't know was recording. The police wound up taking three pages worth of stuff from the house, including some of Rudy's personal property, a 52-inch flat-screen TV, a DVD player, two computers, a camera, and a bunch of DVDs. Under the law, police are only supposed to confiscate property that was purchased with money earned from drug sales. Rudy admits he was smoking pot, but what evidence did they have that he was selling drugs? There was none. There was no sales. There was no undercover cops. There was nothing on paper. It was basically an uh, anonymous tip, they said. The Luke Davis corruption charges raised serious questions not only about the conduct of police officers, but also about Michigan's drug forfeiture laws. This report from a group called the Institute for Justice, Policing for Profit, rates all the states for their forfeiture laws. Michigan gets a D-. In Michigan, in a drug rate, they can take your property just with probable cause. In a lot of states, the burden is a lot higher. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. What's in like Kentucky? State police are investigating one of their own. A fellow trooper caught on camera engaging in a shouting match that ends with the trooper right on the ground. Good evening, everyone. I'm Doug Prophet. And I'm Rachel Platt. That road crew telling us that trooper put everyone in danger, not only by going too fast in a work zone, but also by stopping his car in the middle of the highway. That crew working along Dixie Highway as part of a larger project near Radcliffe at the hardin Mead County line. What happened when the trooper got out of his car was all caught on tape. Our Derek Rose has been making calls on this story all day today. And boy, Derek, this one has a lot of people talking. It sure does, Rachel. In fact, our viewers shared this video with us through Facebook. And the video is quite compelling and shows what some are calling an officer out of control, putting himself and everyone around him in danger. It's one bitter confrontation that quickly turns physical, with the man in the shorts being taken to the ground. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Something Damon Johnson has not seen in his 20 years doing road construction, but on Monday morning, a first. 
We've confirmed the man is Kentucky State Trooper Anthony Harrison. And as the confrontation escalated, Johnson claims Harrison punched him. And his co-workers took the trooper to the ground and held him until uniformed officers could get there. No, he was going to get somebody killed. Because him sitting in the middle of the road, all it takes is for a semi to come flying up there like they always do and see that there's nowhere to go. According to Johnson and the rest of his Scotty's contracting crew, Harrison was upset because he felt as though there was no indication warning drivers of road work being done on Dixie Highway near the Hardin Meade County line. And according to Johnson, the trooper stopped his car in the middle of Dixie Highway and got out to let the crew know how he felt. But that crew tells us the takedown was necessary. You know, and that was just for our protection, for his protection, everything like that. I mean, somebody gets thrown out into another lane, anything like that, you get hit by a car. If a like a semi or something was coming down, it would have rear-ended him. It could have flipped over the wall. It could have took out the whole crew. We don't take down police officers for nothing. We did it because he was going to get somebody killed. And right now, no charges being filed in this case. State police are investigating through their internal affairs division. We do have another perspective on this story, and that's from the woman who you see yelling back at the trooper. And here's what we're working on for you at 6 o'clock. That woman will explain why she was the first to approach the trooper when he got out of his car. And the new opinion she says she has, this, this incident has given her on police. That's next at 6 o'clock. I'm Derek Rose, WHAS 11 News. Welcome to the twilight zone of government gone wrong. Hampton, Florida, population 477. And the only way I could relate to it was the old Dukes of Hazard. They'd make Boss Hogg look like a Sunday school teacher. It started a few years ago when the city of Hampton sanctioned a speed trap along Highway 301. The tiny town had 19 police officers. That's one officer for every 25 residents, writing tickets to boost the city's coffers. On this side of the road, you got Sheriff Gordon Smith says one of the officers was nicknamed Rambo. He was actually getting out of a car with an AR-15 strapped across his shoulder, had like SWAT tactical gear on. To write tickets. To write tickets. This is crazy, right? Let me tell you, that's way above crazy. Seventy is like a two hundred fifty dollars ticket. It wasn't illegal, but in three years, officers wrote about six hundred thousand dollars in traffic fines. But when state auditors examined the city's books, they found a rotten cesspool in this swampy landscape. For starters, how that money was spent is unclear, and it's triggered a state criminal investigation. A few weeks ago, this bombshell was dropped here on the front porch of City Hall, an audit of the way the city of Hampton has done its business. Inside, 31 different findings of inappropriate action, questionable record keeping, shady accounting, accusations of nepotism, money that's missing, you name it, it's in here. And now some state lawmakers want to make the city of Hampton disappear, wipe it off the map. According to the audit, several city employees were overpaid roughly $9,000. A city credit card had $27,000 of questionable charges and $132,000 were charged to a city account at the convenience store next to City Hall. City officials say they're reviewing their operations and considering the audit's recommendations. That's a lot of money. But nothing symbolizes Hampton's woes quite like this. We found the elected mayor sitting in the county jail. He was in office a month and a half when he was arrested in an undercover sting and charged with selling oxycodone. He denies dealing drugs and he's not connected to the city's financial mess. The impression out there right now is that uh, the people who've been running Hampton are just a bunch of crooks. Exactly, and I think that's, that's not very far from the truth at all. They're either a bunch of crooks or a bunch of really stupid people. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it like that, but it's the truth. You know, I mean, and it looks more like they're crooks than anything. But you, given the situation where you're in, um... Yeah, I look like a crook sitting here in an orange suit, don't I? <laughs> the city's former clerk, Jane Hall, is one of the central figures in the state's audit. She hasn't been accused of any crimes, but the audit was highly critical of how she handled city business. We were here and gave you guys a chance to... After we left, Hall emailed us. She wrote the questionable expenditures were for city-related business and is documented. She added, there has been a deliberate campaign to make me look like some kind of criminal mastermind. That would be like saying Snoopy is Cujo's twin brother. Told us to make sure we watched the no trespassing sign, gave him a chance to talk to us, and they didn't want to. We look corrupt as heck. 
I mean, what the heck's wrong with us? Former Mayor Jim Mitzel walked off the job several years ago. He isn't suspected of any wrongdoing, but Mitzel says the mayor's $125 a month paycheck isn't worth the headache. City officials are asking state lawmakers who want the city shut down for one last chance to fix its problems. The former mayor thinks they should get that chance. The government bailed out General Motors, the government bailed out Chrysler. Why can't the state of Florida bail out Hampton? Don't shut our town down. This Our town should not be shut down. Right. 911, state your emergency. There's a dead body floating in the bay. A nude and decapitated body pulled from the waters off South Padre Island. We collected evidence from the tire shop. Fingerprints were there in the hands. I'm here with your husband. He's the first suspect. Why? It's hard to explain why your Border Patrol badge is with cocaine, money, and a cartel pistol. A Border Patrol agent is being charged with capital murder associated with the Gulf Cartel. He was on our team, so yeah, we're very concerned about that. He is not one bad apple. He is part of a rate of corruption that exceeded that of any other U.S. federal law enforcement agency. Unmarked car with lights and sirens pulls up behind you in traffic. What do you do? One frightened driver called 911, and tonight we learn that is exactly what you should do. KXAN lead investigator Brian Collister has uncovered a traffic stop that raises questions about why and how the officer pulled the driver over. Round Rock police rushed to a call for help. A driver talking to a 911 operator says someone is trying to pull him over. It's a white pickup truck and the guy's wearing a suit and he brake checked me and I went around him on the right side, gave him the finger and he turned all these lights and sirens on. Moments later, before officers arrive, the man following the driver points a gun at him as he sits in his car. Do you have your ID with you and then we're going to move up in this yes, parking lot and get this ID. figured out. The officer figures out the man who pulled the gun is Texas Ranger Michael Smith driving an unmarked DPS pickup. Driver David Van Curen is fuming and wants to talk to the Ranger's boss. I want the director of DPS down here to talk to this guy. He doesn't he deserve to be doing that. And then when I ask him who he is, he, all I see is a gun shaking and I'm like this. So what happened? Ranger Smith claims Van Curen almost crashed into his truck as traffic slowed. It goes around me, flies around me real fast, okay? Shoots me the bird, okay. and this house starts my truck. Get out of the truck, I demand to get out, okay? He puts the car in reverse. I draw my gun. Ranger Smith tells yeah, the investigating yeah. officer he got out of his truck to talk to the driver and only pulled his gun after feeling his life was in jeopardy. His truck has no dash cam, so it's the ranger's word against the driver in this incident last February. But KXAN has also obtained evidence Ranger Smith was not exactly telling the truth about exactly when he pulled his pistol. Listen to this crucial part of the 911 call. He's getting out of the car now. He's got his gun drawn and he has no bed. What the f***? What are you doing? They might need to get somebody there. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? At the scene, Ranger Smith also backs off his claim. The motorist almost crashed into him. Tell me what you want, Bill. Man, I want him cited, but there's nothing good to cite for. Besides, yeah. Yeah. good cited for. Yeah. You know, he didn't strike my vehicle. I took a little base back to missing. Okay. Did he cross the line when he did that? I don't think he did. No. Okay. As for the driver, who did not respond to our requests for comment, he got off without a ticket. At what point did you realize that this guy was an officer? When he was right next to my window with his gun in my face. And I said, are you crazy? Who are you? Okay. And he said, I'm a DPS ranger. And I'm like, in an emailed statement, DPS says, quote, our employee acted inconsistent with policy exercised poor judgment, and conducted himself in an unprofessional and discourteous manner, all of which are unacceptable. The department has taken corrective action with this employee regarding the policy infractions.
DPS did not respond to questions about the truthfulness of Ranger Smith's account of exactly when he pulled his weapon. Now, what are you supposed to do if a car pulls up behind you that's unmarked and tries to pull you over? Do exactly what this driver did. Call 911 to verify it is a law enforcement officer. Right. You can have 30 more cops come up and put guns in your face. And it's all because you caught them. That's awesome, ain't it, guys? Yeah. Sure. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so this last part's going to really piss everybody off. This is the reason why I film the police and I hold, try to hold them accountable for their actions. They think they're above the law. They think they can't be touched. Qualified immunity for the police is something that really, 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 really needs to be re-looked at and readdressed. It's basically the way it is now. It is a it is a license for the police to kill you and get away with it. All right, guys. So here it is. This is the reason I do it, and this is probably going to piss you off. Imagine what it would be like to go away to prison for a crime you didn't commit. The sobering reality is that it happens more often than you may think. In fact, since 1989, 2005 people have been exonerated from prison in the U.S., but other innocent individuals, they're not so lucky. Today, we're gonna to examine how the wrongfully convicted reclaim their lives after often spending decades behind bars. May 19, 1975, a money order salesman was accosted and subsequently robbed by three black men in a convenience store in my neighborhood. One of the assailants proceeded to shoot the victim twice, but she expired from his wounds. Fast forward, May 25th, I was 18 at the time. Just as I was selling in for the night, I heard a lot of ruckus on the front porch. Before I could get any sense of what was going on, the front door was kicked in. I saw flashlights, shotguns, handguns, and a lot of police. They grabbed me off the couch, slammed me to the floor, and cuffed me. Took us downtown and proceeded with an interrogation. I told the police that I knew nothing about this crime. We were totally innocent. They had a written statement they tried to get me to sign. I was physically beaten up by the police, all in the course of trying to get me to confess to something I know we had no part of. We learned that a young boy that lived in our neighborhood went to police and reportedly said that he had witnessed this crime. And these assailants were myself and my two friends. For whatever reason, everybody else, testimony, witness accounts just seemed to vanish. Eventually, we were all found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to die in Ohio's electric chair. To be sent to prison for something you didn't do, I mean, it's so indescribable. And you have to fight every day to maintain the person that you are. And that's something my mom always told me. She said, you went in as Ricky Jackson, and that's how you have to come out. Don't let them turn you into a prison. When guys get phone calls in prison, it's usually bad. So I got the phone call that day, and I wasn't expecting it to be my mother. The thing that hurt me about that most is not that she was passed and I knew she was sick, it's that I couldn't cry. I couldn't even grieve for my mother because they had made me so callous and heartless. I couldn't even cry for it. I tried so hard, but I couldn't. People have forgot about us. They forgot about this case. It was almost 40 years ago. But the people, the Ohio Innocence Project, they didn't leave no stone unturned. And the person that put us in prison is now a middle-aged man. We had made some contact with a local writer. He tracked this guy down, and he told the truth. On November the 24th, I was released and found to be totally innocent. After 39 years, I was finally able to walk out. <sighs> I was just finally, it was, it was cold, it was crisp, but it felt so good out there. Standing on the courthouse steps.